Being on the front lines in the fight to educate the next generation is tough. The goal of this podcast is to provide you with important updates, encouragement, and connection. Welcome to the Institute Leaders Lifeline. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Institute Leaders Lifeline. My name is Mike Sinclair, Deputy Superintendent of School Support at the Charter Institute at Erskine. And this is our very first encore performance. Yes, we're replaying one of our most popular episodes. It was actually our interview with Senator Greg Hembry, Chairman of the Senate Education Committee. And he really spent a lot of time with us laying out his vision of what education looks like, what he thought this general session would look like um, in the Senate and even in the House. Uh, so I'd love for you to spend a little bit of time replaying his comments and then looking at what's going on in the Senate and in our General Assembly. Uh, he's a very wise man, and we appreciate his support. So enjoy this encore performance of Senator Greg Hembry, Chairman of the Senate Education Committee's interview. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Institute Leaders Lifeline. I am joined by a great friend of ours in the Senate, the South Carolina Senate, Senator Hembry, he's chairman of the Education uh, Committee in the Senate, and we really thank you for giving your time. I know this is a really crazy time as you're ramping up the new session. Yeah, it's, it's already busy. <laughs> yeah, you started it's good way to be with you. Yeah, good. Well, thanks for joining us. We're also with our good friend Superintendent Cameron Runyon, who's joined us for a couple of interviews. So, looking forward to just having a good dialogue and just kind of letting you meet Senator Hembry um, and find out some more stuff about him, as well as some things that we could look for coming up in the Senate Education Committee. So. Let's kick it off. We talk as school leaders about raising leaders for the next generation. I mean, we, we've got to be looking at it. There is a vacuum of leadership right now. So tell me a little bit about how did you become a leader? What are some of your influences that got you to this position? Well, you know, it's like most people, I think uh, I had uh, a father who was a leader in his own, in his profession. And um, uh, he was an example to me. Um, my mother was a leader in her profession. And so that I had a, a you know, st strong example at home. Um, I had some teachers along the way as you know, junior high and high school teachers that were um, certainly one that inspired me to be a lawyer. Um, another that was a uh, sh she was a history and civics teacher who um, was just that kind of, a was that teacher, you know, that inspirational teacher that if you're lucky, you know, you get that. You know, we've all had at least one, you know, mo usually meant several, but she was that, she was that teacher uh, and probably led me to my interest in government, um, you know, and, and how things work and the Constitution and then, the, you know, the, the separation of powers and, and, uh, and all, all those things I learned from her. So, um, uh, well, I mean, my parents, you know, supported that, but that she was the one that I, I kind of got got it when I was going along. And quite frankly, um, got involved in leadership in my Methodist Youth Fellowship group as a junior high student. And, you know, you think, well, it's just something to do, you know, and you're, you know, but, but it was the first time I got elected to anything <laughs> and I started doing the work and I thought, well, that's, I, I kind of like that. And literally, you know, student council on up and president of the student body and, right. uh, you know, kind of uh, president of my fraternity, you know, he just sort of was this progression. Uh, the president of the fraternity, uh, that was about the point when I decided I didn't want to be a leader. <laughs> and, uh, but I got through it. It was, it was, uh, I'm not doing it again. I will I will if, if I'm, you know, if I'm nominated, I will not accept. And if I'm elected, I will not serve. So not for a second term on that one, but, um, you know, didn't really plan. I you know, didn't, did not plan to go into, um, it wasn't my plan to go to the South Carolina Senate that, you know, this, these things are more organic than they were, you know, like I'm going to do this and this and this, it was, it just sort of came to be. And, um, uh, quite frankly, the, um, I did want to be a prosecutor, and, and then I realized I would like to lead a prosecutor's office, and I got to do that uh, for 25, well, the lead the office for 14 years. Uh, that was my profession. You know, that's what I spent my, my adult life doing, and then this position in the Senate came open, and um, thought, well, it was time for me to leave the solicitor's office. You know, you kind of knew I was getting worn out. It's a high-pressure job, and um, I thought, well, you know, why not try the Senate, and so here I am. That's awesome. That's, that's a awesome. long story. You know, well, what's what's great is we, we see we see parents, and we, you know, that's a strong piece of what we need in our culture and society now. But then education, just the just the role teachers play, and they don't realize it sometimes. So it's great to see how that plays well, out. Well, in my church, you know, in that and the you know, church, even in, right. in a leadership way, that, that, that folded into it to, to kind of you know sort of foundational building blocks. That's great. That's great. Well, <clears throat> Senator, as I recall, you're a bit of a baseball fan, uh, and um, 
you know, in South Carolina, it seems like in the past few years when it comes to empowering parents uh, to make choices for their children's education, we got a pretty good batting average. Uh, I think the, the General Assembly, y'all have just been terrific uh, leading and opening up uh, avenues for your constituents and families writ large uh, across the state of South Carolina. So as, as you look at the landscape now, we have a, a new, you're, you're, the, you're the senior statesman now uh, in education in South Carolina. You have a new uh, chairman in the house, uh, Shannon uh, Erickson, who's going to be there. We're very excited about her. Recently interviewed her as yeah, well. Yeah, she'll be terrific. She'll be terrific. Um, uh, Ellen Weaver, our, our dear friend, close friend, uh, Ellen Weaver, we're very excited about her. And she obviously has a, a very visible commitment to school choice and has for a long, long time, as does Chairman Erickson. And then, of course, Governor McMaster. Uh, has been very open about his support of school choice as well and furthering options for parents and students across the state. So as, as chairman of, of education, you're looking around now, I would assume, at a landscape where, where sort of all the, all the pieces are in place, where all your colleagues that have an impact on this, that it seems that there's general alignment uh, there. So I would just, what is your, sort of your hopes uh, for the next few years uh, in, in the school choice realm, be that in public school choice or, or even beyond that, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a, a, a sign over my, in my, you've been in my office, and uh, when you leave the, the Senate Education Committee office, there's a sign over the door that says students first. And uh, I've been up there, I've been chairman for four years, that sign's been there for four years. And I really do, you know, I really look at this issue of educating our kids from the vantage point of the students first. Um, the, the, uh, you know, the, the principals, the school boards, the administrators, um, every, every other sort of group in the K-12 system has lobbyists over there every single day looking out for their interests, okay, and advocating for their interests. And that's appropriate. I'm not knocking that at all. That's fine. But there's, there, there's really one group that does not have that advocate. And, um, I mean, these are these are highly intelligent uh, um, you know, advocates in the lobby. They're getting paid a lot of money to fight the good fight for whatever they're fighting it for, whatever subgroup. But there's the, the, the kids, the students, and the parents don't have anybody over there for them. So, and I, you know, I even just take it to the students themselves because sometimes the parents are the problem. I mean, and, you know, it is. I, I came with a background in criminal justice, yeah. and I saw it over and over again that there was, you know, you, you could figure out why this kid's in juvenile court when you met mama or daddy. And you realize well, this is, you know, this this kid doesn't have a chance because it's, it's sorry parents they've got that happens. Um, but but so, I, you know, my, my so it, that folds back into the choice. I think that um, it's not, a, you know, kid, ch students are different. Children are different. Their 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 family situations are very different. So I think it's the only way to to maximize and to reach a full that child to reach their full potential is to find the right choice that fits. You know, the traditional public school is going to be the right choice for most kids. I mean, that's going to be the best choice. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but it's going to be the best choice. But but there are other options out there that many times are a better choice for that child. You know, virtual education. And and we, we went, you know, we, we experimented with our, this pandemic forced us into this situation where we had to have this broad based virtual program. It was a it was a catastrophe. I mean, and even those that were defending it back when it was you know, being deployed and they were caught, you know, critical of me because you could see what was happening. Um, and I was taught, saying it um, now are saying, you know, that was a failure. I mean, the most biggest supporter back then was saying, we'll now acknowledge that that program on a large scale was a failure. But there were students that did it. You know, they, they were forced to do it and it suited them. Right. And now they're in virtual charter schools. Um, or other programs, but mostly it's charter schools, and they're thriving in that environment. So, you know, you can't just assume, you know, that everybody's the same. And, and, and so uh, if, you want to, if you want every child to reach their potential, and we all say we want to do that, then as a legislature, we have to expand that, those choices and keep looking for different ones. Um, you know, I think the, the education pod idea is one that's, you know, not really, I don't know that it's taken off in South Carolina, but it's, you know, it's a, it's sort of a variant on the homeschool. I mean, right. there's going there are going to be students. That's going to be a good a good model for. Um, um, you know, well, there's. I mean, so we just have to we have to be willing <clears throat> to. You know, we don't have to defend the status quo so desperately. It's not K twelve education. Public traditional K twelve education is not going to collapse. It's not going to crash and burn. And these these stories that the you know sometimes the the, the status quo crowd 
presents uh, these narratives are, are they're overblown and they're not accurate and they're and they're scare people and um, and they're they just aren't they're not wise and it's and they're not looking out for the student first they're looking out for a system okay it's not our role to protect a system it's our role to look out for that student so um, can I know, say amen right there amen brother yeah it was a bit of a it was sermon number twenty seven it did sound that way but it, you know I feel strongly about it. and and. Uh, um, we have, of course, we have education scholarship accounts that we're going to be debating coming right up. It will be, we're hoping to have it the, the very first bill that we debate in South Carolina. And so uh, it will provide an, a, a pathway for students that otherwise could not go to private school to give them an opportunity to, to try that as an option. And it's not picking winners and losers. It's giving choice to, uh, to our, our, our students and, our, and, our, and their families. So just one more um, opportunity, option that we're going to look at. It's a big deal. I mean, we've been talking about it in South Carolina for 25 years. Uh, we were within a cat's whisker of passing it last year, and hopefully we'll be able to, to push that through this year and, and have that add that to the choice stack. But, you know, I don't, quite frankly, Cameron, looking forward, um, you know, I don't know that I have any new other models, you know, that I'm looking at right now, uh, other, uh, uh, man, I mean, there's only so many ways you can do it, I guess. But um, but I think we, we always have to be open-minded. And, and I think uh, as the people that set education policy, be prepared to go, yeah, it's a little risky, but why don't we give it a try? You know, it might help. It's not going to help. It might not help 50% of our students, but if it helps 2%, that's 2%. It's a game of inches, you know, so. That's true. Well, and, I, and I love what you said. So I, as you know, I have my own children are in a virtual mm -hmm. uh, learning environment. Oh, and uh, uh, my, I have three that are old enough for school. One is still is not there yet. Um, and it's been, you know, it was a challenge making the, the switch to virtual. But in our situation, they have a mother that's at home uh, that can be there, that can, can mentor them and lead them and tutor them. And it's just been phenomenally successful for them. And they've just flourished. And what it has really taught me firsthand as a, as a, as a parent and as a superintendent is, is reinforce exactly what you just said, which is that one mode of education is not necessarily right for two different students. Even within the same family. Correct. I mean, you know, so it's, it's you got that. And, and I, I'll just add one more thing that I always, um, I don't want to leave this out. I don't want to forget it. You know, when you talk about education choice and, and sometimes there are teachers that are in the traditional K-12 system that, you know, they just get really upset about, you know, even suggesting that something other than their particular model is, is maybe uh, successful for a student. Um, I always say to them, and I think this is important to, to note, this is choice for them too. This is choice for teachers. When you have different opportunities to provide learning in a different model, many of the teachers are, are you know, they're not, they're not upset about the pay. They're not. They're upset about the bureaucracy that they're having to work in. That's what's really driving them out of the profession. And if they can find another model to teach in, some of them just thrive. You know, where otherwise they were kind of getting burned out and bumping along and not really finding fulfillment. Uh, this is an. Uh, this is not just school choice for kids. It's school choice for teachers. And um, and I think that's. I mean, I think it's something that kind of gets missed in the conversation because we get so focused on defending uh, uh, or you know, kind of taking our positions. But I think I think it's it's great for educators too. That's right. a smart point. And leaders. And leaders. Absolutely. Absolutely. Speaking of bureaucracy, I think that's one thing is navigating all of the requirements out there. Are there is there any talk from your end or any thoughts on any way that we can evaluate some of that bureaucracy? What's an effective way that we can encourage our leaders who we hear from that we can partner together to maybe help you or help Representative Erickson or, or Superintendent Weaver see those things? The um, the General Assembly, it was my bill, matter of fact, but about five, four, four or five years ago, uh, we passed a, a bill that required the Department of Education to do an analysis of the bureaucracy in the system. And you really have to do it literally from a schoolroom all the way to the right. top. And, and I, we can't go, I mean, D.C. is a different problem, but at least the top of South Carolina. And, and that's where most of the, you know, most of the action is. Um, and we got us, you know, we, they, they did it and we got a study back, got a report back. And like a lot of the, you know, the things we do in Columbia, and I'm just as guilty, you know, you get the report. And I mean, I read through it, but, you know, it's, you put it on the shelf and it starts getting dust. And then 
you know, you haven't really taken any action to address the the the, the challenge. Um, there is a renewed interest in that. I, um, I'm, I'm, I think it's a terrific idea. I'm a great supporter of that concept. I know that the new superintendent is very interested in that. I know that uh, Representative Erickson very interested in that. We've all talked about it. Uh, governor's offices. We're all we're all singing this off the same sheet of music. The the challenge though is the work is not pretty and it's not easy because you literally have to get way down into the weeds. It takes somebody time, effort, and energy to find out, you know, that form that we fill out that we were doing from 1972, you know, we're collecting all that data on the computer over here now. We don't need to fill out. I mean, there are things like that. We, you know, I, I, I know it. Um, and, and I perceive, I don't know, I know there are a few things, but my perception is there are probably quite a few things that we could either condense uh, to use technology to streamline or you know, or lim you know, eliminate them altogether. Just they're they're obsolete. So um, I'm hopeful that's but the, that sort of an analysis, you know, sort of paper flow analysis has to be done by the uh, I think by the department okay. and the districts themselves. Um, I mean I, I don't think you can send you know the department can't send a team to every single classroom. Just yeah. not workable. Uh, but they can manage the program through the districts. Give them some because you're going to see patterns. You right. know, you're going to see things that are it's what they're doing in Florence One is similar to what they're doing in Horry County. You know, we saw this problem over in Florence One. You're doing the same thing, and you know, so y'all might want to compare notes. I mean, I think right. they're the clearinghouse for that effort and the coordinator of that effort. But it really will have to be a district wide kind of thing. Right. Um, and you know, uh, one of the things that we and this just goes back to something we've done as a society. I saw it in law. You see it in medicine. You see you see it any any place. You know, we we over time. You add processes. Right. We do a whole lot of process for very little improvement in value. Okay, um, and and I, I mean I can just to give an example. When I started as a you know a young prosecutor, my file for a bur you know, burglary case would be about that thick. By the time I finished, um, you know, twenty five years later, my file for a routine burglary case was now this thick. Right. There wasn't that much more in there. I mean, a lot of paper and a lot of process, not a lot more value. Um, so I, you know, and that's just. Human nature, and it's, but but you know, there's no reason why we can't tackle that and get rid of some of this stuff that just we don't need anymore. Right. So yeah, we're we're on. Well, most of it's with good intention. You know, that's why I said right, we, right. we we hire a new position to make life better, and that person tries to make life better, and they create processes. Right, right, right. It's we don't it, eliminate the old ones. We just that's keep adding. The, that's the problem. Ones. You know, even uh, we even talked about um, uh, in in meetings with the superintendent and uh, representative Erickson. About and I kind of put put it back on the department. I said, "Tell us in Title Fifty Nine, the code that that right. covers education. Uh, tell us in Title Fifty Nine what we need to. You know, we you, I know there's a bunch of archaic, unnecessary statutes in there that are just. I know it. I, I, we we've eliminated a few of them on, on some work I've done on. So um, uh, you know, but that needs to be a more systematic analysis and quite frankly I don't have the knowledge base and sometimes I can look at a statute and go, it sounds kind of I wonder if we still do that but I don't know I don't I'm not in the you know I don't manage schools as a that's not my job so um, I need somebody to tell me yeah senator we really could get rid of this and, right. and we I'd love to start cleaning out the drawers like that that's great to hear that's great to hear. I'm a bar that is that does the process add value because it is tempting to, to you could just create processes all day long, but and they don't need more people. They need more to manage people. Manage the process. They didn't add yeah. any value in the first yes. place. So, yeah, I, I, mean, it's, I, it's, I love it's, that. That's wise. That's wise. Um, so, Senator, you know, we've been at this now at the Charter Institute at Erskine for five years of operation, and we had a year zero. So we're at six years total that we're in to right now. And <clears> um, you were around when when we came onto the scene. And and you remember that there was there was a season of of, of turmoil. The, the waters were churned up yeah. uh, a little bit. And, and in the past few years, of course, with uh, Superintendent Neely coming to the public charter school district, and we've seen the collaboration between these two districts reach what some have said is is a historic uh, level of cooperation and collaboration between two you know, competing, uh, if you will, uh, school districts. Um, can you speak from you know from your vantage point from where you sit on how that relationship, that collaboration, that that co laboring uh, mentality between the public charter school district and Ersk and how that's impacted uh, school choice and the charter sector and and beyond uh, in your opinion? Well, you know, there's there's a couple of ways to approach that. One, you've got a group out there. There are people out there that are going to be against public charter schools. I mean, it's not a huge number of people. They're vocal. They can be loud. 
Uh, and so they're looking for opportunities, as you know, to, to try to yank the rug out from under the charter school movement and that the public charter school movement. And I talk to people all the time that still somehow think this is a private school. It's the darndest thing. It's just, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding out there and mischaracterization, quite frankly, sometimes in that conversation. But um, so when you got, you know, you got some people that are sort of trying to, you know, trying to knock you over the head anyway, um, to be at odds with one another uh, is just, it's not good for the, for the, it's not good for the students, right? It's not good for the, the system. It's not good for the effort. It's not good for the students. So, um, you know, when, when Erskine started, and quite frankly, I was a little, I would, uh, you may remember, I was a, a little skeptical. You know, you just don't know how an experiment's going to work out. And at the beginning, it's an experiment. And, uh, and it's, been a, it's been a tremendous success. You've heard me say this a bunch of times. You know, it's one of those that you go, hmm, I hope it's going to work out. And then it does, and then it really exceeds your expectations. You're just like, wow, this is a great experiment. Right. It really turned out. Uh, and I think, honest to goodness, I think the reason, one of the fundamental reasons that it did work out so well was because y'all, you know, you and Chris Neely, y'all got together at a point. I don't know exactly when the magic happened. It was right when you started. It was pretty soon after you started. It was pretty quick. Yeah, we sat down and had lunch. When he had been offered the job, we went to lunch and you know, laid out uh, some, some ground rules for how we thought that these two districts could come to, together as one. Yeah. Well, that was the magic lunch. Yeah. So I'll, <laughs> if I, send me the bill. I'll pay for it. It was it was worth it. No, it was. Uh, but when, you know, and y'all have stuck to that. You know, you haven't. Um, and, and I'm sure there are disagreements that have come up between the two of you, but I don't know about them. And, and I, they're not talking about them on the street. You know, that's not, oh, the charter schools are in disarray. No, I mean, it looks like y'all have your stuff together. And when you you guys are you know presenting together at budget meetings or at other meetings, uh, Senate Education Committee meetings, um, it's impressive. I mean, it makes it makes for, um, uh, I don't wanna say, well, I, have an old, I have a saying that, you know, legislators don't want justice, they want quiet. Uh, but that's not really, it's not really true like that. But there is a lot of, uh, when they see a lot of trouble and noise and smoke, they, you know, they feel like they got to run to it and do something, and um, oftentimes that leads to unintended consequences. So I think that cooperation, and I don't, you know, I think it's, it's been a, a critical thing. And you know, limestone now is coming on, coming online, and I've, you know, you and I've talked about that numerous times. I've talked to the leadership at Limestone, and no uncertain terms, I'm like, y'all need to, you know, y'all need to work all three of you together. Um, if you want this experiment to be successful, it's a one piece of advice I would give you. So, and that'll take time. I mean, you don't do that overnight. You know, you got to build relationships, and they're such in an early stage. But um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a, a lot of fun to to watch and be a, a little bit of a part of. You know, so you do y'all doing the heavy lifting. Well, that is a great encouragement. Thank you. For yeah, that. Oh, it is. It's true. All right, I'm gonna go back. And I'll ask you a personal question here, okay. a little softball question, but it's important to our leaders. One thing that we've talked throughout this podcast is, as a leader, you have to embrace all the roles. You can't pick and choose. Like you, you're, you got a family, you got a career, you got all these different things. And, and I know you, you have a great career. Your leadership in the Senate is very diverse in your roles there, but, but you also have grandkids and you got a family, you got all that to take care of. How do you juggle all that? Or what, what advice would you give to some of our younger leaders, our new leaders that are up and coming? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, uh, it, it, I've given this advice to people that were looking at going into the General Assembly. Um, make sure your family foundations are, are you know, that, your home is solid. That foundation, that's where you start. That's that's your firmest, you know, that's where you start here and then you go out like concentric circles. Okay. Um, and if, if that's not solid, and, and quite frankly, you know, I've told people that had young families that were thinking about running for General Assembly from our area. I've discouraged it. I'm like, you, you, General Assembly will be there forever. You know, you can do that anytime, um, but you can't go to your son's first football game every time, and you're gonna miss a bunch of that right. stuff if you live where I live. You now, if you live in Columbia, that's a different situation. Um, but I, you know, I don't know. I think you just do the best you can. I, I, everybody's kind of. I don't know that I have any really profound wisdom about um, how to balance. Your, you know, your, um, your time with family and time with work and time, you know, time with the paying job and then time with this work. You know, this isn't. I mean, it pays, but not very much. Can't live on it. Um, so, uh, other than, you know, make sure you. I guess it's heavy priorities in order. And with me, you know, if my grandkids, I mean, I'll, this happens all the time. I'm in my, my little home office downstairs in my house. I'm working on reading, you know, I'm preparing a summary for a bill or, you know, I'm talking to somebody about some issue, working on constituent issues. And my grandkids show up at, on, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday and I go, 
okay, you know, do this later. And I mean, I will, you know, it's, it's not, you know, I guess it's seldom is it, you know, the world's not going to stop turning. You know, <laughs> okay. It really isn't. Right. And you're not the only one that can take care of this. You know, you really aren't. No, so um, uh, you feel like you are, but you're not. And so, uh, but your grandchildren are, you are the only grandfather they have, you know, so um, you can't, can't, can't replace it. It's that prioritization. Yeah, I think just, you know, and kind of knowing who you are. I mean, real basic stuff, kind of knowing what's important to you. But that's a lot. But knowing who you are, not not who you think others want you to be, who yeah, you right, are. Right, right. Yeah. I think that's... And it's hard. You know, it's not, it's not as easy. Not as, if it was easy and we'd all be, we'd all be self, you know, self-aware and well-adjusted human beings and we're all a little weird, you know? So, <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, Senator, you, you'll recall when... Um, when the Charter Institute was formed, that one of the emphasis points that we had was on rural education. Mm -hmm. uh, Erskine College, of course, we come out of Erskine College, is in Abbeville County. Uh, very long history in, in Abbeville County and some of the challenges with rural education. And and we've done some of that. And, you know, we, we founded Belton Preparatory Academy, which is the number one Title I school in the state of South Carolina for two years in a row now, and number two overall. I'm glad you worked that in. Yes. I mean, that's a good one to work in there. Yeah, so, that's it's something to be proud of. Uh, but it's, it's you know, it's important because I think what, what a school like Belton proves is that it's possible. Yeah. It's possible to do it. And it doesn't take a magnificent facility. Yeah. They're doing it in portables and in a church. And it really comes down to leadership and culture and expectations for, for students and a process to get the students there. Um, but so that's been a heart of ours and, and it's been great to have some wins like that. But when you look at South Carolina, there, there's so much more that needs to happen for our rural communities. I grew up in a rural community in Hampton County and I think in 10 years, there were three of us out of that community that I'm aware of that went to Furman University because they just don't get that kind of opportunity by and large. Um, so as a policymaker, how do you think we begin to really reach into those struggling uh, poor rural communities that have languished for so long and, and to provide that, that found educational foundation that so many of them desire because we just see parents lining up in droves whenever we go to open a school right. in those areas. But but it's a hard, it's difficult to open a school and run a school in a rural area as well. So I would, would love your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think you've got the right answer already. I, I mean, charters are, are part of the answer. I know they're, you know, with the ES, the education scholarship accounts, there's some um, parochial schools that are, that are, that are looking at uh, building facilities in rural areas that they, they believe with this additional money that the families in that area could 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 go to that kind of you know that school that have that school choice as an option um you know I, the the challenge in rural schools is is it's been around for a hundred years i mean this is not a new problem it's 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 a it's a universal it's a it's na national problem in these communities that um they don't have thriving economies they don't really have much going on and so it's just an impossible to recruit teachers there. I mean, that's the that's the uh, you know the hardest part. And we're working, uh, we've been working hard on that. We're going to continue to work hard on teacher recruitment retention in South Carolina. Quite frankly, I think the you know if there was a silver bullet, and there's not a silver bullet, but if I had to pick two things that if I could wave a magic wand and 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 say okay, the, if I could fix this in a day, I think it would have the greatest impact. It would be to have a system program method of preparing exceptional school leaders, particularly at the principal level. I think that's where the, that's where the, really the rubber meets the road. Um, and, um, superintendents are important, but um, if you've got great principals, you can have a real average superintendent and it won't matter. The, the, the problem is you, if you have a real average superintendent, you're probably not gonna have a bunch of great principals. That's the, the problem with that. And then likewise, um, the second thing would be the preparation of teachers and uh, uh, having, you know, having them prepared better prepared to be working in a classroom. I've been talking about it like this. We need to prepare teachers more like we prepare doctors and not so much like we prepare lawyers. Um, you know, lawyers kind of go in the classroom and they sit and the, you get, get a lecture and you get, get asked questions by the teacher, Socratic method kind of stuff. But you're not in a courtroom. You're not dealing with clients. You're not dealing with people. You don't have any idea what practicing law is about. I didn't know anything about practicing law. Thankfully, I had some you know charitable fellow lawyers that took me under their wing and, and helped me learn what being a lawyer was about. Um, same with doctors. They, I mean, they do some classroom stuff, but they're in, they're in with patients. They're in the clinics. They're working the job, and it's and so. I really believe, and we do a lot of it, you know, and, and there are places that do more of it. I mean, so it's, it's not that it's not being done now, but I think that's where we can really ramp up how we prepare our teachers to be truly 
ready to go into a classroom to deal with parents, to deal with children that are, you know, causing trouble or whatever, you know, uh, chaos in the classroom to, um, you know, how, the, how wh what is going to make me effective and how to be effective with that kid versus that kid. Um, those are things you can't learn. I mean, it's like being a lawyer. You can't, you don't, you try a case. These, these are nuances that you got to try cases. Nobody can tell you this. you got to try them and you'll figure it out. You'll learn it if you're paying attention at all. And then same thing, I think, with teaching. And I think, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, and I think if it's part of that, I think that the, the rural initiative is, is where we can make that difference, at least in the traditional K-12 system. Let me go back to that. I think alternatives, we talked a little bit about that, are critical, too. Uh, and it's worked and it can work in other places, but it's just a matter of where you can find a good fit. Um, but it, when you're looking more at the traditional system, I think the key to that is it's going to be grow your own. I mean, you're going to have to. That's that's absolutely sort of the concept that we have to pursue. And then how are we going to go about that? And we're doing a lot. There's a lot already going on and a lot of good things that are already going on there and success stories. So it's not like it's a whole thing's a failure. It's that, you know, you got a pocket here that's making it work. And then you got these over here that can't seem to get out of their own way <laughs> and they can't recruit because there's nothing there. I mean, well, if I'm a smart young teacher from Horry County, why would I want to go to a place where there's you know there's nobody for me to date? There's nobody for me to go out with. There's no place to go, you know, except for the Sonic, you know, and uh, go shop at the at the dollar store. I mean, you know, it's just not. I mean, it's not making fun of anybody. It's just we got a lot of communities that are struggling, and there's just right. nothing going on there. So it's tough. Right. Yeah, that, that's a great point. We do see that in charters often, particularly in our rural communities, mm -hmm. that it, it can be very difficult to bring the talent in, yep. and because charters have to perform, they have to have talent, or it doesn't work. Um, so what you see in some charters, particularly in our more rural areas, is that they even have to go so far as to rely on teachers from other countries I mean, to, to bring them in. And that's such a wrong headed. I mean, they just need, they just need a warm body in there. Um, and I had a, a guy who was a principal tell me some years ago, and he's now um, uh, is dean of one of the colleges of education. But um, we were at this meeting and he um, talked to me after he said, we, I want you to help. I want to help you understand something about this. And he was in a rural district. He said, I used to he was. I was a principal in this rural, this rural school, and he goes, I just needed somebody with a pulse. I mean, I, I didn't have the luxury of this, you know, all this talent I could just bring in willy nilly. I just needed a warm body up there to prevent, you know, pandemonium. And um, and he goes, I'm not saying it's good, it's bad, but I'm saying it's real. And, and when you're that principal, you're stuck with that. So. Um, um, you know, that's us. We've got to, you know, that's the trick on figuring out more. Right. We got to build that talent pool and make it not only larger, um, but we need to make it better or better prepared. I don't want to mean better and accessible. And accessible, right? Well, the governor had a, you know, that was in his uh, speech today. I mean, he was talking about, you know, making the teaching profession more attractive. <clears throat> well, he's, you know, he's, we, we've raised salaries now by, right. by um, thirty-three percent in five years. Wow which is nobody's getting that, you know, nobody in, yeah. in state government or in government. Um, and then we're looking at where he's, he's wanting to raise it another $10,000. And I think he's on the right track. I think this is part of the transformation of the profession. Um, things have changed. I mean, it used to be, y'all know this, teachers were, you know, I mean, my, my teachers were, you know, their husband had the insurance. It was like leave it to Beaver days, you know, their husband had the insurance agency and she was, you know, she was, the wife was a teacher and sort of, you know, it, they weren't relying just on her income. You know, maybe they're getting some benefits and that was a good thing, but you know, it wasn't the, it was the secondary income in the family. And, um, and that's kind of what you had and you could pay, so you could pay people less and get away with it. If, you know, as a government or you know, taxpayers could get away with paying teachers less because it was a different, you know, sort of societal structure. Now, you know, you got to put these are this is their primary income. I mean, you don't you're you know a lot of times t teachers are married, you know, or um, and they're you know they're both teachers, but you don't have well I'm I only really make this much, but it's okay because he makes that much. You know, it's it's not you don't have that same model anymore. So we've got to and you know, we've got to we're going to change the pay scale, but a lot of issues with that too. Okay, I'm, <laughs> that's a whole other show. Well, personally, I, I hope that that is is. Y'all continue that effort that you've made so much headway on that at some point we will we'll start to attract men into the classroom yeah. as well. And we, we need those positive male role models, particularly in some of these communities where candidly you just don't have the male presence in homes that we may have had 40 or 50 years ago. And yeah. so to have that these men in the classroom to, to model what it means to be a responsible man in society and, and to contribute to the society is just desperately needed, in my opinion. Uh, I know. And there's some good efforts, you know, some good efforts, as y'all know, going on in South Carolina, but they're small. I mean, they're kind of small and, and they're localized. You know, some districts have their own. Uh, Charleston has their own program 
that is you know geared toward getting men in the classroom. Um, and you got you know the Call Me Mister program, sort of the one everybody, you know, the mm -hmm. flagship. Everybody knows about that, and it's a it's a very successful program. So um, I think you know, there's a, there's it's like I say there's not that there aren't success stories out there. Just aren't and you know we need more. And we just right. got to keep building. Right. On a daily, annual, session basis in the Senate, I know y'all have some really heavy topics, and we've talked about several here that are serious, and a lot of people are going to be impacted by it, um, especially our youth. But in the Senate, what is a funny story? What is something that you didn't see coming or you don't have to use any names? We don't want to incriminate anybody. But what's something that's happened that maybe we would not ever have thought about in the Senate? Well, um, so <laughs> it's going to be a hard question to answer because uh, it could lead to long stories. <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll say this about the Senate. I, you know, you, 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 um, uh, in the Senate, everything's seniority based. So your parking space, literally, your uh, office, your uh, where you, where your desk is. You know, these are all everything is seniority based. So it's like you know, you come in the first day and they, you know you go well. Which you still want your parking space? So this one's come open. You could get that one. It's really funny. Um, to me, it's funny. But um, we, I sit on. I've been there ten years now, so I'm kind of in the middle of the pack, and um, I'm still sitting in the same desk that I was sitting in the first day I got there. And there's a group of us that sit together, that we've been sitting together now for 10 years. And um, one guy left us for a while, and then he, he went up front, he, and then he came back because he missed us. So, <laughs> so I say that to say we do funny stuff. We sit back on that back row like a bunch of misbehaving boys in church. <laughs> and um, not bad misbehavior, just sort of you know mischievous behavior. Yeah. And we have the best time. We we crack on each other, we joke each other, we joke about other senators, and we really enjoy each other's time and company. Um, so there's a lot of funny things that happen, and we and we all have kind of a, you know, sense of humor, which we see a lot of things that are funny. So um, uh, we, we have a lot of things that happen in there that are funny, and, uh, and you know, you see them on the floor sometimes, but bunches and bunches of them, you know, come up in the back room. And, I mean, Harvey Peeler's one of the funniest guys. I mean, that, that man is hilarious. And, um, I mean, he, he – and so he, he – um, he kind of keeps like in caucus or something. He keeps us off balance. And uh, he used to, what he used to say, he goes, I always got nervous when uh, when Wes Hayes was asked to tell a joke or I was asked to pray. So uh, <laughs> and I, that's what Peeler said. So, so he, you know, he was, um, so I, you know, one story probably, but I would, I, I think it's, People, it would be interesting maybe for people to know that it's not just, you know, banging the gavel and lots of arguing and fussing and fighting. There's some of that, but mostly we get a whole lot of laughing and a whole lot of getting along with each other. And, try, and truly, the longer you stay, I think you sort of you want to stay more for the people that are there with you that are your, you know, that you respect. Almost like being you know, soldiers, you know, you're you ultimately you're not fighting because of the flag. You're fighting because you want to look out for your platoon, you know, your commitment okay. to these people that you're daily with. And I mean, we have this. I mean, I don't want to say the commitment diminishes to the overall objective, but I think you do have this sort of relationship that builds that um, makes you want to come back and, you know, put up with a lot of bad travel and, you know, just a lot of aggravation. It's worth it's worth it because you sit back on the back row and laugh. You know, have a good time. Right. It's important, I think, for people. I'm so glad you shared that. It's important for the people that are watching to remember that our senators, our House members, our governor, our superintendent of education, all the people who have offered themselves to serve on behalf of the people to represent the people. At the end of the day, y'all are people. Yeah, right? when we put on we put on our pants. There are not, you know, I mean, there's not many exceptional. I mean, you know, you occasionally meet somebody who's really, really, really exceptional, but mostly in the Senate, we're we're people that come from our communities that are, you know, um, have a pretty good. Uh, generally, the it's, it, democracy works. You know, you're a pretty good reflection, you know, of your community. Tom Corbin is a good reflection of Traveler's Rest. Right. You know, which is a lot different than uh, Charleston. You know, Sandy Sin on James Island. Sandy Sin is a very you know, she's a very accurate reflection of that electorate there. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you might not I might not agree with my friend Tom or Sandy on something, but that's okay. It's that's the whole point. Right. You know, it should we shouldn't be lockstep. You know, we're all different, have different uh communities. So um yeah, and but, but we're all just we're just people trying to do the best we can mostly. Well, we appreciate you serving uh, on behalf of your constituents and the entire state. 
as chairman of uh, education committee. We've certainly in, enjoyed your leadership and uh, your vision and uh, your courage, uh, frankly, to, to do the big things that need to be done to support children and families. So thank you for that. Well, thanks. Appreciate that. And thanks for joining us. Yeah, fun, I really yeah. appreciate it. It's yeah, a great it's conversation. Well, it's, it's fun talking. Appreciate to you guys. that. And hope you guys uh, that are listening enjoyed uh, our time with Senator Henry, Chairman of the Senate Education Committee. The one thing I'm gonna really take away from this is um, one: the Senate are people too. They're not just locked away in a room and come out to bang a gavel. But Senator Henry sees the same things that we see in education: the the rural education, the demand on teachers, the um, all of those components. So we're not working in a vacuum. Our leaders see the things we are, but what we need to do is look for ways to work together. We can't just be problem identifiers. We've talked about this. We have to be problem solvers. And we can only do that when we stop looking at differences, find our commonalities, and start helping leaders like Senator Hembry. So thanks again for joining us. We hope that you have a great rest of your week. Take care of yourselves and take care of those that you lead. Be sure to follow the Institute on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Erskine Charters, we'll have all of these resources, including this podcast, many stories of our schools, and other things. So check us out. The opinions expressed within the content are solely the authors and do not reflect the opinions and beliefs of the Charter Institute at Erskine or its affiliates.